Reading through the Bible in a year, February 24th, Exodus chapter 7, Luke 9, Job 24, and 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And Yahweh said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts and my people, the children of Israel, out of the uh, land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so, just as uh, they did just as Yahweh commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 years old, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as Yahweh had commanded, and Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they all became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as Yahweh had said. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning, as he is going out to the water, and stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness, but so far you have not obeyed. Thus says Yahweh, By this you shall know that I am Yahweh. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood." The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And Yahweh said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. There shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Moses and Aaron did as Yahweh commanded, in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. Uh, He lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile. And all the water in the Nile turned into blood, and all the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them. As Yahweh had said, Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not even take this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after Yahweh had struck the Nile. There we go. Make sure we have all the notes in the middle here. It keeps up with them, but when we get to a a section where there's nothing for a while, it'll be a little bit before we'll see anything. In some cases, it'll just skip it. There we go. Let's move on now to Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent uh, sent them on ahead of him two by two, and every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. 
But if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. And do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day, meaning the day of Christ's return, for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, meaning wise and understanding in this age, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the, or rather, who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then, turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, "Uh, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Well, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going along that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So, likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, people whom the Jews, as a rule, hate, because they um, mixed with the people of the land during the dispersion, and it was a big deal. Um, Also because they um, were the first of the people to be um, cast into exile, because they continually rebelled against God, but we'll get to that later. So this dirty Samaritan, according to most Jews, uh, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, that's two full days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will pay you when I, or rather, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who uh, fell among the robbers? He said, one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. 
She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Uh, Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you, you are anxious and troubled over many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Job 24 Job continues, Why are not times of judgment kept by the Almighty? And why do those who know him never see his days? Um... Move, sorry, some move landmarks. They seize flocks and pasture them. They drive away the donkey from the fatherless, and they take the widow's ox for a pledge. They thrust the poor off the road. The poor of the earth all hide themselves. Behold, like wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go out to their toil, seeking game. The wasteland yields food for their children. They gather their fodder in the field and they glean the vineyard of the wicked man. They lie all night naked, without clothing, and have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the rain of the mountains and cling to the rock for lack of shelter. There are those who snatch the fatherless child from the breast, and they take a pledge against the poor. They go about naked, without clothing, hungry. They carry the sheaves. Among the olive rows of the wicked, they make oil. They tread the wine presses, but suffer thirst. From out of the city, the dying groan, and the soul of the wounded cries for help. Yet God charges no one with wrong. There are those who rebel against the light, and who are not acquainted with his ways, and do not stay in its paths. The murderer rises before it is light, that he may kill the poor and needy, and in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer also waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me, and he veils his face. In the dark they dig through houses. By day they shut themselves up. They do not know the light. For deep darkness is mourning to all of them. For they are friends with the terrors of deep darkness. You say, swift are they on the face of the waters. Their portion is cursed in the land. No treader turns to, uh, toward their vineyards. Drought and heat snatch away the snow waters. So does Sheol, those who have sinned. The womb forgets them. The worm finds them sweet. They are no longer remembered. So wickedness is broken like a tree. They wrong the barren, childless women, and do no good to the widow. Yet God prolongs the life of the mighty by his power. They rise up when they despair of life. He gives them security. They are supported, and his eyes are upon their ways. They are exalted a little while, then they are gone. They are brought low and gathered up like all others. They are cut off like the heads of grain. It is not so. Who will prove me a liar and show that there is nothing in what I say? There we go. That's all the notes to hear. Let's move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right, we're going to open with this. Uh, This is the head covering section. Um, I've gone over this in detail before. Um, Right now, I'm largely just saying, read the notes. Um, I will briefly touch on this. So, in Corinth, um, at this time, there were um, a lot of people who were... It's a good way to put this. Um... Basically pushing for equality, the same way we see today. Now, 
as you know, if you've read through Scripture with me, uh, Scripture is deeply complementarian in that uh, men and women are equal in almost every aspect, but there are some things that uh, men are uh, given specifically to do better, and there are some things that women are given specifically to do better. uh, Thereby, both of us complement each other. No one is better than another. But going back to um, Genesis chapter 3, where um, Eve is told that your desire will be for your husband, not yay, my husband, but uh, rather against him. What happens is there's jealousy over things which we should not be jealous of. God has assigned to certain people specific roles. And within um, Corinth, there was a massive problem occurring because people were expecting to, um, or rather, there was a major push for essentially feminism. That women were just like men in every aspect. And um, in fact, it was a denigration of men as a whole um, that was kind of an ongoing thing. So, part of this is the whole kind of weird head covering thing. Now, for us in our day and age, this may not make a whole lot of sense to us. This is deeply uh, rooted in the traditions of the people uh, of Corinth. Um, This is not something that Paul repeats in any of his other letters um, about the specific head covering pieces. Um, He doesn't uh, say, say, in the the letters to the Thessalonians or the Ephesians, hey, don't forget all the women, you better be wearing your head coverings, um, you know, because of the angels. So, as I'm just going to read through this, just like it is. But I would strongly recommend reading through both the notes in the Reformation Study Bible in the middle and in the ESV Study Bible on the side. Let's begin. Now, this verse is actually the first verse here. It's tied to the previous text. So, we'll just pick up in verse 2. Now, I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. It's that complementarian roles defined by God. He's our creator. He's the one who's made us um, from nothing for the purpose of worship of him. So it is up to him to define these roles if he so desires to do so. And we've read through scripture together. If this is your first time going through it, you'll see it yourself as we continue. These are roles that God has defined for specific people for specific reasons. We may never understand all of the reasons, but this is what God has done. Picking back up in verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered, dishonored his head, which is the Christ, But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, which is her husband, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or to shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, again, read the note on this. It won't make a whole lot more sense, but it'll help. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as a woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to uh, pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? 
But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. There's a giant note in the section here on the Lord's Supper, uh, specifically what it actually means and some of the historical um, and theological uh, discussions and things with it in the past. Strongly recommend reading it. It is fantastic. Picking back up in verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. You know, he's talking about um, they're basically church services. Now, remember, they wouldn't just have church services on Sunday. They would have them multiple times throughout the week. They would all come together for worship and glorification of God. Verse 18, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. What is this? People would typically have a meal. So the Lord's Supper wouldn't typically be just as we have it today. Um, It would be um, at at some... um, Baptist churches we've been part of in the past, once a month or sometimes twice a month, they'll have what's called a family meal, where everybody uh, produces something at home and you know brings um, a lot of it so that everybody can share together. And we have, um, after the church service is over, we have an extended time of fellowship with one another, um, helping each other, serving one another. It's a beautiful time. And that's largely what this is. But during this meal, which is, again, a normal meal, then they would also have um, the ceremonial Lord's Supper. Verse 21. For in eating, one goes ahead with his own meal, and one goes hungry, and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? People who were poor would show up and have nothing to eat. Maybe they had nothing to eat for the entire day, perhaps for a couple days. So this would be an opportunity for them to eat with the church and not feel ashamed. And yet people are just going up and having six or eight helpings. What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Make sure we don't lose notes here. Continuing on, verse 28. Let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you are weak and ill. Some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers... When you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when he, uh, rather so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about other things. I will give directions when I come. And that is it for today. That is all the reading and all the notes. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. 
Behold, the word of the Lord.